and Nicole and I are from Communicate Health. So uh, many of you, if you've attended any of these trainings before, you, you've heard a little bit about Communicate Health. So I won't say a whole lot, but basically we are a health communication company, as the name of our company implies. Uh, we are all about making health information easy for folks to access, understand, and use. Uh, I am the content strategy director at Communicate Health, so I lead our team of content and communication strategists. Um, so we are the folks who write all the things, basically, uh, and social media is part of that. Um, we do quite a bit of social media for uh, many of our clients and many of our projects. And let me pass it over to my colleague, Nicole, to introduce herself. Thanks so much, Andrea. Um, I am a project manager for Communicate Health. Um, I have the privilege of working with Andrea and our other colleagues, um, primarily to uh, manage and oversee uh, many federal public health agency social media channels. So I'm really excited to walk through this presentation today. Thank you so much. Pass it back to you, Andrea. All right. And uh, before we move on, I will say that we are happy for you to put your questions in the chat box uh, throughout the training. I know there's a Q&A box too, but if you just want to use the webinar chat, that way we'll just have one place to look. Um, and Nicole and I will do our best to monitor the chat throughout the training and answer them in real time if we can. If we don't get to everything or there's something we can't answer, we're also happy to follow up after the training and we are planning to save time for questions at the end as well. Um, what else was I going to say about questions? I had another thing, but I forgot what it was. Oh, I know what it was. Um, so I think the training is scheduled to go until three o'clock Eastern, but um, if we're at that point and we haven't gotten to the questions at the end where Nicole and I are also happy to stay on a little longer and, and answer folks questions. Uh, if you would like captions, that is a Zoom feature um, that you can use. I think there's a little menu. You might have to click the more button and then you should see an option to click captions, show captions, something like that, if you would like those. So let's take a look at what we hope to accomplish today. Uh, we have four kind of main objectives for the training, which is that after today's training, you will be able to write clear, actionable, engaging social media posts to communicate important information to your audiences. Um, and I'm seeing information about the chat being disabled. Um, so maybe we do need to use Q&A. Emily or Lola, I don't know if you can clarify that for us and you can maybe put in the chat or in the Q&A, let us know. Um, yeah, do you know, Emily, what's going on there? No, but I'm happy to take a look into it. Okay, awesome. Oh, now it works. Okay, I don't know, maybe there was a delay. <laughs> <laughs> All good though. Either way, we'll watch. We I've got the Q and A in the chat open, so we can we can watch stuff come through. Um, all right, what is our next objective? Uh, that you will be able to effectively use hashtags and emojis in your posts. Kind of a fun um, aspect of social media writing that doesn't apply to other types of writing, or maybe it's not fun. Maybe it's annoying and scary to use hashtags and emojis. I don't know how you feel. Um, next, increase engagement with your social media content. So these will be tips that are not just writing tips, but other ways that you can hopefully increase your audience's engagement with your posts. And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about using alt text to help make sure your posts are accessible. So let's start off with, assuming you all can use the chat, um, can you share an emoji that represents how you feel about social media? Um, there's a little emoji button down at the bottom of the chat that hopefully you can click and see your whole selection of emojis. Maybe I'll even start us off. How do I feel? <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Party. I like that one. I don't know what I would say. Mm -hmm. What is that with the unamused? I like that one. Kind of smirk, upside down smile. I see. <laughs> These are good. Yes. Confusing, maybe. <clears throat> Eye roll. I feel that a lot as a 41 year old. Oh, what is that one? Oh, yes. These are great. Thank you. So, okay. So we have a broad spectrum of feelings about <laughs> social media, which makes sense. Uh, they're still coming. I love it. Um, okay. Well, no matter how you feel about social media, I think you can come out of today's training with some uh, hopefully practical advice to at least make you feel like you can use it more effectively, or maybe, it, maybe it'll be a little, little easier to use. All right, so why is social media important? Just want to start here getting us all on the same page. 
Um, basically, it is a well-established health communication outreach tactic. So in other words, it works. Uh, it is, it's easy to use and it lets you really quickly and effectively reach large numbers of people. And as you know, that, that can be really, really important if you are communicating about something like a, a disease outbreak or a natural disaster that just happened or a foodborne illness that is spreading, you know, any type of emergency communications, right? Um, being able to, to communicate quickly to large groups of people is, is key. And just one more note, as you can see here, research actually does show that campaigns create longer lasting behavior change in their audiences when they include a social media component. So that is a very good reason to not just put your info on your website and in fact sheets and things like that, but to also share your messages via social, no matter how you may feel about social. Because a lot of people are looking there. All right, one more question, and then I won't ask you any more questions for a while. Um, I'm curious what's the biggest challenge you face, or maybe just a challenge you face when it comes to using social media to communicate your messages. And I know it'll take you a second to type, so I will pause, take a drink of my tea and see what comes into the chat. So, oh, a smaller following, interesting. Mm -hmm. Growing followers, right? You wanna reach more people. Anybody else? Mm-hmm. Same. Okay. Yes. Catchy captions. Yeah. <clears throat> I know. We want to be, we want to be cute, you know, on social. It's it is, it's a different style of writing. It can also give us some creativity, though, which is nice. We don't always have that in other other forms of writing. Backlash and conspiracy theories. Yep, that is a big one. That is a big one. And that is tough. And we could do a whole training on that <laughs> for sure. All right. <clears throat> difficult to understand content. Yes. So, and we will talk a little bit about that and how to, you know, break down information clearly, but that is tricky because as you know, social media has limited space. All right. Feel free to keep putting answers in the chat, but I'm going to move us on um, and start by going, going over some tips for identifying your audience. So who do you want to be communicating with via social media? and who is actually following you on social. And we'll talk a little bit about tailoring your content to different audiences. So identifying your priority or intended audience really lets you focus your messaging on the people who are gonna benefit from it most. So these are examples of questions you wanna ask yourself when you are, you know, you're getting ready to communicate about a particular topic you know, and you you think you sort of know who you're going to communicate to, but if you can really narrow that down, how how old are these folks? When are they usually online? Level of education? What content are they most interested in? Again, those are just examples. But the more questions you can answer about who you're trying to reach, the more you can tailor your content to meet their needs. So if you are maybe you're writing a post encouraging people to get their flu vaccine, and it, you might have a general post, right, to lots of folks, but you might want to tailor those posts to specific audience groups. So if you want to talk to older adults, for example, and encourage them to get a flu vaccine, you're probably going to use different wording and different framing than you would if you're trying to reach college students or parents, you know, asking them to get their kids vaccinated, that kind of thing. And it can be more effective to talk directly to a smaller group of people. All right, not letting me go on. Hmm, interesting. There we go. All right, you can also use demographic data to find out who is actually interacting with your social media content. And you can pull that data from the platforms themselves. So you'll see some examples of that on your screen, things like X, formerly known as Twitter, Analytics, Facebook Insights. Uh, if you look at the last bullet, You'll see that there are also different types of software that you can use to pull audience data. We've used maybe all of those at Communicate Health. Um, so, okay, what, what do you do with this data? Well, basically social media analytics tools help you track engagement metrics. So what posts are people engaging with? What posts are they not engaging with? Things like that. So you can really you know, understand your audience's behavior and what seems to be working well and what doesn't seem to be working so well. So you can measure the effectiveness of your different social media strategies and approaches, maybe do more of what is working and less of what doesn't seem to be working. Okay, so on this slide, you will see 
uh, two posts that appeared on the National Eye Institute's uh, social media channels during Glaucoma Awareness Month. This wasn't this year, I think it was maybe last year, but one of the posts, the one on the left is for consumers, by which I mean consumers of health information rather than uh, professionals. And then the other post is for professionals in the field, eye health professionals, health educators, uh, things like that. So these posts are about the same topic, but they are tailored to those two different audience groups. And I, I'm going to stop talking for just a minute so you can read those if you if you haven't yet, and then we will talk about them. All right. So as you can see, the one on the left for consumers is all about encouraging people to get a dilated eye exam. It talks directly to the reader and encourages them to do just that. Take charge of your health by scheduling a dilated eye exam. Uh, that is a really big, getting a, a dilated eye exam is a really big call to action that, that the National Eye Institute uh, gets across uh, to people during Glaucoma Awareness Month and actually during most of the year. That's a really big um, action that they are always promoting. In the post for professionals, on the other hand, uh, NEI, the acronym for National Institute, does not need to tell professionals to get a dilated eye exam, but it does want to message to them during Glaucoma Awareness Month. So it has a different message for them though. Its message for them is share our resources to your audiences, basically. So um, that is you know, a, a different, again, similar topic, same topic, both during Glaucoma Awareness Month, these probably went out two days in a row, maybe even the same day, but different messages. Uh, you can see that the one for professionals starts with calling health educators everywhere, which is one strategy that you can use if you're writing posts for different audiences on the same platform, which sometimes happens. Then people know right away whether that particular post is for them and whether they should keep reading or keep right on scrolling. I will also note, though, that these posts happen to be on different platforms for NEI, and that is also a strategy that some organizations use and can make sense. Like if you know that a particular group mainly follows you on Facebook, you may write Facebook posts tailored to that group, but maybe over on LinkedIn or X slash Twitter, you are reaching a different audience. There may, though, be times when you are sharing a message that is relevant to most or even all of your followers, and you want to reach folks throughout the community across demographic groups. So um, vaccine comms can be an example. I know I was talking about how you can tailor messages to specific groups, but there may be times too when you just, you know, you just want to tell everyone, maybe new COVID vaccines are out and you just want a message letting folks in the community know that and encouraging them to get vaccinated. Um, emergency communication would be another good example here. You know, any sort of emergency air quality is really unsafe or there's some event that contaminated the water supply. So yes, it's totally appropriate then to use your social media channels to just reach everyone who is on those channels. In those cases, when you are writing to a broad audience, we have a couple of tips. Um, the first of which is be sure to use language that doesn't exclude anyone. Uh, so a sort of obvious example might be if you are part of Gen Z, be careful that you're not using a maybe a sort of a slang term that is super familiar to you and and maybe your friend group. You may use it, but uh, older adults in your community may have no idea what you're talking about if you if you use it on social media, or if you need to include examples of like foods, activities, things like that. Uh, just be sure that you are including maybe multiple examples so that you are. Uh, at least have something there that is like culturally relevant to everyone rather than giving an example that actually doesn't really apply or feel relevant to a huge um, or even a small you know portion of your community. Uh, the other one here is, yeah, decide if there's a common message or call to action. And there, there will be, I think, in these cases that we're talking about and go with that. So, um, but a specific example to stick with the vaccine appointment thing might be, you know, make a vaccine appointment today rather than something like make your family's vaccine appointment today for folks who are not making an appointment for their family, living alone, don't have kids, you know, whatever. Um, just be sure that you are not excluding anyone. Um, I'm actually going to skip that last tip. Okay. 
Now we're going to talk a bit about the voice and tone of social media posts. And just a reminder, feel free to put questions in the chat. I'm trying to keep an eye and I'm sure Nicole is too. But voice and tone, what are voice and tone? So voice, as you can see, is the consistent style or personality of the writing. And your organization's voice actually should not change whether you are writing social media posts or um, writing on your website or speaking to the media, any form of communication. And no matter who you're communicating to or what you're communicating about, the voice is consistent. The tone, however, is the uh, mood of the writing. So that is something that can vary and will vary and should vary uh, based on what topic you're writing about, the context in which you're writing, and the reader's uh, emotional state. Um, and I will give some examples of that in a minute. Yes, and I see something in the chat here about uh, being inclusive of individuals in recovery by not showing needles for vaccine posts. Yep, definitely. That's a great best practice to follow for sure. All right, okay. So these posts are also from NEI, the National Institute, but do not worry. Our future examples are not, we're, we're not only gonna give you eye health uh, communication posts since that's probably not relevant to some of you or I don't know, any of you. Um, okay, so I'm gonna pause again, let you read two versions of this post, a before and after, and then we will discuss. Okay, I'm reading them in my head, but I don't know if I speed read in my head or if I'm giving you enough time. Um, okay, so NEI's voice is knowledgeable, empathetic, and engaging. And that is literally um, some of the terms that it uses to describe its, its own voice. Uh, knowledgeable, because a huge part of its work is educating people about different eye diseases and conditions. So it, you know, it needs to sound knowledgeable to help ensure that people believe what it's telling them. Um, it wants to be empathetic in part because it's often communicating with people who have really serious eye diseases and maybe could lose their vision or have lost their vision. So empathy is key. And then engaging. It wants, of course, its audience to feel engaged and to connect with its content. So the actor post successfully embodies that knowledgeable, empathetic, engaging voice. It comes across as those things. Did you know some types of peak eye get better on their own? If your case is mild, try using a cold compress and eye drops at home. Learn more. So um, definitely knowledgeable. It's it's dropping some knowledge there. Um, it is engaging. I think opening with a question. Did you know? Which is a opening with a question is a great tactic to use on social media, and we'll talk a little bit about that coming up in a few slides. Um, and empathetic. And this isn't like a pink eye is not a super serious topic, but I can feel I can feel the empathy coming through in this post too. Just like hey, I understand this is rough. Did you know it can get better on its own? But here's some things you can do to get better, right? That's basically what that is saying. In the before post though, um, you know, the voice is probably the knowledgeable part is coming through, but I would not call that post either empathetic or engaging. Um, it's very dry and formal. Most cases of pink eye are mild and will resolve on their own without prescription treatment. In many cases, symptom relief can be achieved by. So, um, just not great. <laughs> that doesn't feel like it's empathizing with the reader at all. Um, it's not talking directly to the reader. Um, you know, just kind of boring, honestly, is what I would call that post. Um, so that's voice. Tone, you can see the tone of the after post is described as conversational and positive. Uh, and I, which I definitely think it is, and I do actually want to point out that conversational and positive are probably, you probably always want your tone on social media to be conversational and positive. Um, however, I noted tone can change and that is true. The tone may also be other things depending on what you're writing about. So it might be conversational and positive and X, Y, Z things. So if you're writing a post about, you know, something about, I don't know, protecting the environment on Earth Day, you can be playful, that, have fun with that. Maybe that's a playful tone. But if you're writing about cancer, uh, you would not want to be playful, right? Um, you might have a more serious tone. So you can be conversational for sure, 
but still be serious um, when when that's appropriate. And yes, I see the comment about did you know posts. Um, yes, and of course there's the DYK, did you know hashtag and agree, did you know can be a really effective way to pull the reader in. And we definitely use that quite a bit on social. All right, so we've talked about voice and tone. I am curious if any of you know or <laughs> want to take a guess at um, adjectives that describe your organization's voice or just how would you describe your organization's voice? So remember the examples um, of voice on the last screen were knowledgeable, empathetic, and engaging. Curious if you have any other adjectives that you would use to describe your organization's voice. If you want to pop those in the chat. Informative is great, yeah, um, and definitely lots of uh, <clears throat> any folks who are providing health information for an organization, yeah, informative, like educational, maybe those are great. Professional, for sure. Caring, yes. Oh, and I love approachable. So that is great. That is, that feels like, yes, people feel comfortable with you. They, <clears throat> that's a good one. Personal, caring, empowering, yeah. Um, educational, definitely, yeah. So I see a lot about, which makes sense, you all have a voice that, yes, certainly is about informing and educating your, your audience, um, sharing knowledge with them, but also um, connecting with them, showing them you care, things like that, right? And empowering them. Trustworthy is a big one. That is a big one. Yeah. And I know it can feel hard to do that on social, <clears throat> but um, yeah, that's a, that's a really important one. Great. That's awesome. Um, I was going to say too, before we move on, it is, oh, accountable. Interesting. It is a good idea if you haven't, and maybe some of your organizations have to like officially define and establish your organization's voice. And this isn't just for the purposes of writing social, but um, for anything that you're writing. And so when I say officially define, I literally mean like documenting somewhere, what is your organization's voice, whether you have like a content strategy or something like that. Um, you know, the voice of our organization is encouraging so people feel motivated. It is helpful, but not prescriptive, something like that. Um, we, we do it in that it's this, but not that. That's often how we define it. But, you know, the purpose of doing that is just to help make sure that everyone who drafts content for your organization is using a consistent voice and is speaking to your audience in the way that your organization wants. So, okay, let's do tone really quickly. So uh, how might the tone vary for these? Let's start with holiday travel safety. Like what might the tone be if we're writing about holiday travel safety? So thinking about folks, you know, going on road trips for Christmas or flying somewhere for Thanksgiving, that kind of thing. And I have thoughts if you all don't, but I'm just gonna let you you share first. What what kind of tone might might we might we use? Upbeat for sure. Yeah. Um urgent. Cheery for holiday travel. Yeah. And I was gonna say, like, I think you could have fun with that one, right? We're not we're not talking about some disaster that has happened, but you know, encouraging people to whatever, wear their seatbelts, stuff like that. So I think you could be fun and playful with that. So I like that. Okay, how about an uptick in COVID cases? What might we do for that? Something about the tone. And I'm, I'm, I think we wouldn't want to be cheery and playful in that case. Any thoughts about tone for that one? Yeah, subdued. Urgent and informative, for sure. Yeah. And maybe you want to sound, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like not comforting, but we're quoting reliable sources as cautionary, but, you know, letting people know that, um, there are, there are things, you know, that they can do to protect themselves and things like that. Yeah. Reassuring. That is the tone I wanted. Thank you. <laughs> um, oh, see, I'm at you. Yeah. That was the word I was looking for. Um, okay. So yes, and then in the interest of time, I will I will skip um, tornado recovery, but I think you you get the point. <laughs> Voice stays the same, tone can vary quite a bit. All right, so before I pass it over to Nicole for the next section of today's training, I'm gonna go over some writing tips that you can follow to help make sure your posts are effectively communicating your messages to your audiences. 
First and foremost, you use plain language. Uh, doing this is really the best way to help make sure everyone in your audience understands the messages you're sharing with them, especially folks with lower literacy or health literacy skills. So what does writing in plain language look like? Keep sentences and posts short is key. Um, Generally speaking, shorter is better, and that is especially true on social media where people are scrolling and scrolling and may not pause to read a long post. And sometimes you're limited in how much you can post on social anyway. Include only need to know information. Again, this is always important, but especially so on social where you just have less space uh, than, other, than other places. So you wanna key in on the most important info. I, I know this can be hard, uh, but social media isn't the place to give the details, to give supporting details, and we will talk more about, about that shortly. Use simple words. I think that's what people think about when they think plain language. So most of the time, you don't need to use the technical term. You want to use the term that is more likely to be familiar to people. Use active voice, uh, which is when the subject is doing the action, not receiving. So instead of saying... 20,000 masks were handed out. I would say we handed out 20,000 masks or whoever handed them out. Um, active voice is more direct and clear. Passive voice can be sort of convoluted and it can almost seem evasive. Like I think that example did, masks were handed out. When I see that sometimes I'm like, who, hand, who handed them out? And it's almost like we're trying to hide something. Um, and then we already talked about using a friendly conversational tone, which happens to be a plain language best practice. So in addition to making sure your audience understands your social media content, you want to take steps to help make sure they actually read it. <laughs> so you want to draw them in if you can. A couple of suggestions for that. And one is to start with an engaging hook. So a question is a good engaging hook most of the time. So looking for ways to stay active this winter, uh, you know, something like that. Or what are short phrases you could use? Something like big news you know, and then you say the news, but those types of things, I don't know, that might seem gimmicky, but we do want to draw folks in and that is a good way to do it. Oh, wait, I didn't mean to go on yet. Um, yes, using an image that supports your content. If possible, you, you want to have an image with every post. Maybe sometimes that's not possible, but um, the reason for this is that images grab people's attention and they are more likely to stop on posts with images and to keep scrolling if they don't see an image, um, it, you know, cause it looks like a, a block of text and they might just move right on by it. Images also have the benefit of oftentimes supporting your content, right? And maybe even increasing understanding depending on what the image is. All right, include a clear call to action. Uh, every post should have a call to action. So one good kind of call to action is to encourage a behavior. So clearly state what you want folks to do. So here's an example, change your smoke alarm batteries when you change your clocks. That's maybe, you know, one half of a social media post. Maybe that's the second sentence, right? But <clears throat> this is often in health communication. We are all about um, behavior change or, you know, getting people to, to do a particular thing. So we don't have a lot of room on social. We want to state it really simply and clearly. And then, oh, this is a nice tip. And I think we had this in some earlier examples. Um, create a sense of urgency with time sensitive language. Just a little, little tip you can try, but make a flu vaccine appointment today. They really probably don't have to make it today. They could make it in a few days, but you know, getting that idea in people's head is helpful um, to hopefully actually drive that, um, drive them to take that action. And then drive people to more inf information. So this really is key on social. There is only so much you can say there, and that is okay. So really think about what your, your main message is and that need to know info, include that, and then link people to more info. People that want more information will click the link and they will, and they will read it. People who don't are probably not going to read a paragraphs long Facebook post anyway, where you pack all that information in. So um, this is, this is, it can be really difficult <laughs> to just have two or three sentences on social, but that really is the best approach and then link people to more info. 
All right, couple of examples. Um, so the before post says feelings of isolation can be a challenge for those experiencing a mental health crisis, but help is available through blah, blah, blah. Mental wellness matters, hashtag. The shorter after post says struggling with mental health, you're not alone. Visit or call to get help right away. Your mental wellness matters. And then a couple of hashtags. So the before post really does not follow a lot of the best practices that we just discussed. The after post, on the other hand, um, you know, that is starts with an engaging hook, right? It's a question. So, you know, drawing people in and if, they, if that applies to them, they automatically might answer that question. Yeah, yeah, I am. Um, so it's um, speaking to those folks. Uh, it certainly uses simpler terms than the other one that says things like, for those experiencing a mental health crisis. Um, and yeah, definitely the after post has a more conversational tone uh, and a really clear call to action. Visit 988lifeline.org or call 988. The other one says help is available through resources like, you can see how that's kind of a really convoluted way to get there that um, doesn't even seem like an action step, I will say. And it's just not talking directly to the reader and making it feel like it's for them. So basically, after post is a lot better than the before post here. All right. Um, so I am actually going to skip. I'm going to, in the interest of time, I'm going to move us to uh, the hashtags and emojis section. I'm going to pass it over to Nicole for that. Thanks so much, Andrea. All right. So now we'll talk about, like you said, the very exciting topic of hashtags and emojis and how you can use them to optimize your social media posts to engage audiences and even enhance reach. All right. So what are hashtags? Why are they important? Um, hashtags are symbols used to categorize content on the web, kind of like a filing system. For example, when people browse hashtag public health or fight the flu, they'll see all posts that include that hashtag. And so this really allows the users to um, join the conversation. So, you know, the hashtag is also a really effective tool for making sure your content is discoverable for a captive audience, because, you know, certain users who may actively search these keywords or hashtags will see your posts um, or anything along those lines of, the, of a given topic. Um, so if you are looking to reach um, people, active audiences, hashtags are a great way to do so. Um, and you know, it allows users to easily find information this way. Also, if used correctly, hashtags give context to your social media posts and can help people who are already interested in the topic um, find your brand and also expand your, um, your content to influencers or um, active followers. All right, next slide. So best practices for hashtags. So we have A, research hashtags before you use them sometimes. Um, maybe there are hashtags that are not associated exactly with what you think they are. So it's always good to um, do a little bit of research before publishing a post with one. We'd also want to make sure that we're using hashtags that are similar to organization that similar to organizations like yours are using. So I know we already discussed hashtag DYK. This is a really um, fun hashtag that a lot of companies, organizations, accounts use to share um, some interesting new information that you may or may not already know. We also have examples like hashtag flu vaccine, local health. Um, this one might be used to highlight specific local health related news or initiatives. So it might be particularly relevant to your work. Um, and then we also suggest maybe using hashtags related to national health observances. Here we have an example of, you might use healthy vision month, for example. Um, and in general, it's important to um, capitalize, uh, use camel case for your hashtags. It makes it easier um, for folks and audiences to actually scan and read um, read the, the post um, a lot quicker. Um, and, you know, hashtags can be occasionally a little bit long. So those capitalizations definitely make a difference. Um, also note, you know, there are no definitive answers when it comes to which hashtag you should use or how you should use them. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, using, doing some research um, and making sure that, you know, your hashtag strategy aligns with your audiences and um, also, you know, what, what the tone and um, voice of your messaging, like Andrea just discussed. All right, next slide. All right, so using hashtags. So we have some step-by-step -step here. So 
check a hashtag's popularity by searching for it on the platform of your choice. Uh, choose hashtags strategically and don't overuse them. It can be a bit distracting if you have too many hashtags in a given post. Um, we also note that if a hashtag fits into your message, you can actually integrate it into the text as opposed to adding it at the end. And we also note if a hashtag doesn't fit exactly, um, we can uh, include it at the end of the post, vice versa, if it doesn't fit in the message directly. So in this example that we have here, um, we note a hashtag GFF community at the end of the post. Um, and we also spell out the full name of getting further, faster community of practice earlier in the content. So there's reference to both and it will be clear to readers. All right, and now the very fun uh, discussion on emojis. So what are emojis? Why are they important? So emojis are small icons used in digital communication to express emotions, ideas, co or concepts visually. Um, you know, I, as we noted, like I think emojis can make messages really fun. It can change the tone of your overall messaging on, on your platforms. And you know, the options are endless, um, which ensures that you can always keep the, your readers on your on their toes. It also makes it a little more fun for you as the author to, to think through what your messaging might include. Um, it's important to note as well that not every post or comment or caption needs an emoji. Sometimes it might be a little bit too much, uh, depending on what you're posting. Um, and speaking of too much, this, this slide is probably an example of too many dis emojis. It is arguably distracting, but for the sake of this slide, we'll call it fun. And Nicole, can I jump in really quickly with sort of breaking news, something I just read earlier today? Um, and I should preface with, I'm not an accessibility expert, but I was reading about some accessibility best practices on social media and the way that um, screen readers, so for folks who you know, maybe blind or have low vision and use a screen reader to read the content online to them, the way they read emojis, it'll say, it'll be like um, emoji, you know, slightly smiling face, emoji handshake, emoji computer. So if you put a bunch of emojis in a row, that is kind of, it probably is pretty distracting. Also, when you're putting them in the middle um, of a sentence and not like after a sentence, really think carefully about that because in the way it might break up the sentence for folks who are using a screen reader. Absolutely. Thanks for naming that, Andrea. Yeah, so that's a really great best practice to note for emojis. Um, in addition, again, we want to choose emojis that are relevant to the content. Um, we don't want to use too many of them as it could be a bit distracting. Um, and we want to be appropriate, right? So we're thinking a lot about the topic of what we're actually promoting or um, what we're discussing in our posts, and that might inform which emojis we would use or whether we would use them at all. And very important, um, they don't replace words. So uh, emojis are seen as additions, not replacements in, in your text or, um, or um, as you're developing your materials for social media. So we might also name, like, it's important to, before you publish, read it again, consider all of these things, um, and make sure that you're being sensitive to the topic that you're drafting. All right, so in this slide, I'll pause a little bit to give you all an opportunity um, to read these sample messages, but here are some examples um, where we include both hashtags and emojis while also using some of the tips and tricks that Andrea noted earlier on how to draft content for social media. So I'll pause here for just a second. All right, so, in these examples, um, I'll note that, um, you know, we think that these emojis um, allow for the tone and message in the, of these messages to be a bit more friendly, a little bit less daunting, maybe even more entertaining for the reader. Um, we're not using the emojis to replace words. We tried to use them sparingly, only about one emoji per post. Um, and, you know, we tried to consider the topics here. I, I did see um, Denise's comment earlier about refraining from using imagery of needles for vaccine related posts. Social media is always evolving, so we really appreciate that note. Um, I might suggest if we were to swap out that emoji for this um, example concerning measles outbreak, we might swap it out for the doctor or nurse emoji or maybe one of the other uh, medical um, related um, emojis to add to this post here. And then concerning hashtags, 
Um, you'll see that we have a few examples where we integrate the hashtag into the actual message. And we have some examples where we leave it at the end. But the great news about these hashtags is if readers wanted to learn more about a related topic, they certainly could. And they could, could select that and see what else comes up or vice versa. If they were already looking at those hashtags, um, your content or these, these sample messages would populate for them as well. All right, so now we have another discussion question. So I will give you all a second to respond in the chat. Uh, if you could please consider the first hashtag, fight the flu. What do you think is working well or what isn't working well here? I'll also open it up if you'd like to discuss the FDA approval, get your COVID vaccine today. Um, just share anything, any feedback you have with these hashtags. If we, if we have no thoughts, I'm also happy to, to share some. Ooh, I see. The second one is a cash sheet. That's true. I like fight, fight the Flu is a very popular hashtag. Um, you'll find a lot of flu information there. So that might even encourage somebody to, to use this just because it's already so popular and frequently used across, um, you know, federal um, health agencies and local health departments and whatnot. The lower case of the FDA approval makes it very difficult to read. So I would be hesitant to use that as is for sure. The third one is quite long. I, I think maybe there is opportunity to, to cut that up a bit and there might be a better way to, to find vaccine related information outside of that hashtag. Yeah, absolutely. It could be multiple hashtags. Thank you. Absolutely. This is all great. This feedback is certainly accurate. So thank you so much. All right, so now we'll learn about tips for increasing engagement on social media. Okay, so number one, create interactive content. So this might look like creating polls or asking for responses on posts. The bottom line is we really want to invite users to engage with your page and, and help audiences feel heard. Number two, respond to comments, direct messages and mentions when possible. Um, you know, we understand that engaging with every type of post and replying to everything, you might not have capacity for that, which is fully understandable. But um, there might be ways to streamline and prioritize some level of response. So that might include, you know, having pre-drafted um, responses for your more frequently asked questions or comments. You might consider um, just liking or reacting to a comment instead of actually responding as well. Um, three, we suggest tagging other organizations and sharing their content. This could be like retweeting or um, reposting another organization's um, posts or um, resources. Uh, this gives you an opportunity to, to highlight and boost other pages, which we'll discuss um, in just a second, actually. And number four, don't be afraid to take part in social media trends or challenges. Um, an example we have listed here, you might have heard of the uh, what's in my bag challenge. This is um, where celebrities will share um, what are some of their must haves or things that they carry on them daily um, in their bags. Um, and they'll post videos or photos of what those items might include. So a public health twist on that challenge might be something like what, what type of things do you include in your sun safety bag for the warm ones, right? Like that could include sunglasses, sunscreen, et cetera. So that's just an example. Like I said, social media trends always evolving. There's always something new and a way to increase engagement could be um, jumping on and uh, trying those trends. We also have a tip here to partner with other organizations to reach different audiences through social media. So if there are audiences who you struggle to reach, you can consider um, who you might partner with to help you reach those specific audiences. Perhaps you could create posts um, that you could share um, with your partner organizations to share on their social media to promote your organization. So you can work together um, to, to build audiences and expand reach. All right, and this relates to tagging, which I promised we would go over. So we'll go over some tips on tagging now. All right, so why is tagging organization, other organizations important? Um, it gives your post exposure, it encourages engagement, 
Um, it helps create a collaborative environment and it helps build a connection with that organization's audience. So um, reiterate, tagging can just help you get your information in front of more eyeballs and drive traffic back to your sites and pages while also promoting other organizations' successes. Okay, and why should you tag other organizations? Or when, excuse me. Um, tag another organization when a post includes resources or research from that organization, like if you're sharing statistics from CDC, for example, or promoting a collaboration between your organization if you're teaming up on something. Um, we want to be mindful of, you know, sensitive or controversial content. We might not tag organizations, um, you know, if we, if it's a little bit, if the content's a bit divisive or we don't won't want to, uh, you know, bring more uh, unintended associations or, or eyes to something that isn't um, what we're trying to promote. We wouldn't want to tag organizations when it comes to, uh, you know, unrelated content. If it doesn't really have any relevance to them, um, we wouldn't want to bring them in. Or we also wouldn't want to overuse tagging another organization, right? There's a there's a fine line of um, maintaining that partnership without going overboard. Um, but yeah, the bottom line is when there's something good you want to highlight um, or we want to share audience or increase audiences, tagging other organizations, a great way to do that. Um, there are also a few instances where you certainly wouldn't. Um, and the, we want to just keep in mind that also you don't have to tag. So there, there are a few options there. Okay. And using tags. So how do you do that? So First of all, you would check to see if an organization has the social media profile on the platform that you wish to tag them on. Um, if they do, you would find that organization's handle. You would type the at sign, and this should generate a drop-down list of um, different organizations with similar titles. Um, and you would select the tag of the one that aligns with the organization you're wishing to promote in that post. So. Um, some organizations do have very similar handles, so you want to double check before you actually hit publish there. Okay, and now moving on to alt text. All right, so why is alt text, what, what is alt text and why is it important? So alt text describes an image to web users, including alt text um, with your image ensures that all users, regardless of visual ability, can appreciate that content. So I know Andrea spoke a little bit earlier about screen uh, reading tools. This is an example of um, you know, how you can use alt text to make um, your content more accessible for those who use, who may use screen reading tools. Um, and it's essentially, you know, just a short description of an image um, so people would be able to understand what it is if they weren't able to view it for whatever reason. All right, and using alt text on social media. So um, while I talk, we actually do have a, a video here that will kind of show you how you, how you exactly do that. Um, but... And long story short, essentially what you do is you want to think about the image and, um, you know, think about what the image is and you would uh, write that content um, briefly to describe what's going on and insert it in the alt text um, section of the social media platform as a description. So when you actually publish this content, users would be able to click that little alt symbol and it would show the description um, that you drafted of the graphic. All right, and we do have an example of um, an alt text example here. You can see um, on the bottom left, it shows the image description that says an older adult checking the thermostat in a home. All right, and that brings us to our next activity, which I'll pass back to you, Andrea. Yeah, thanks, Nicole. <clears throat> okay, so this is our final activity um, before we wrap up. So, I will show you in just a minute three different um, kind of topics that you might want to post about on social media and have you, you can pick one and draft a post for it. So um, your three options are relating to seatbelt use. So um, <clears throat> increasing seatbelt use among young adults, or you want to tell residents in the community that, hey, lots of lots of homes have high radon levels, so you should get your home tested. Or maybe there's an outbreak of hand, foot, and mouth disease, and you want to let parents know that's going on and tell them what to do if their child gets sick. 
So pick one of these topics, take a stab at writing a social media post that follows the best practices we've talked about today. So the, the plain language writing tips and the call to action and the engaging readers, drawing readers in um, and all those things. And, you know, use an appropriate tone, that kind of stuff, throw in some emojis and hashtags if you want. You don't have to do all the things, um, but just take a stab at one of these. And don't feel like you have to research like links to include and all that. You can, you know, pretend you're linking to something if you want. Um, so I will stop talking at you and let you do that. And if you want to just start, um, you know, dropping stuff in the chat once you have one of those written, we'll take we'll take a look at a few. So, and again, just pick one. And I see, I will say, I see your question, Denise, about how many languages are available in the alt text. And yeah, and I don't, I do not know how um, translating, you know, how alt text is translated and how that works exactly, but that's um, something we can, we will, we will pull your question and ask our accessibility folks on our end and we can follow up um, with Emily and hopefully get you an answer. Ooh, okay, so I see one for seatbelt use. Don't roll the dice with your safety behind the wheel. Dice emoji. Click it or ticket, which is a which is a common hashtag used um, for seatbelt use. And I like that. I like that that is really playful. Like you can be real serious. I was looking up examples of seatbelt use posts and a lot of times they're very much like, um, you know, listen, you your life is at stake, you know, whatever. They're very serious, but like, Maybe when you're talking to a younger audience, maybe some of these are college students, right? Like maybe that's not the right approach. So I do really like kind of having fun with that. I think that can be a great approach for that audience. So awesome job and keeping it short too. Um, ready to go on a road trip? Buckle up before you go. Seatbelt save lives, road safety, other, ha other hashtags I was seeing for sure. And I love the question, drawing them in with a question. That's good. Road trip seems um, really appropriate for that audience too. Um, oh man, everybody's doing the first post. Okay. Hey you, yes, I'm talking to you. So yeah, you all are doing great with the draw them in, engage the reader with a, with a short phrase or, you know, a question. So I love that. Hey you, yes, you, I'm talking to you, Gen Z. Seatbelts are more than just straps. They're your daily fashion accessory for the road. Ooh, I'm seeing cool graphic ideas with that actually. Yeah. Anybody want to do radon testing or hand, foot and mouth disease? Maybe not. I'm just, I'm just going to give it another another minute and see, because I, I, I feel like some of you may still be working on it, and I would feel bad if we went on and <clears throat> didn't give you a chance. I will just tell you, I played around with some, and for, um, oh, know the symptoms. This must be for hand, foot, and mouth disease. Uh, <laughs> no, you're good. It's hard. Yeah. If you hit enter, it just posts it. Um, with that one, I will say with that post, I, I played around starting with a attention parents, right? Draw their attention. Maybe then there's emoji an emoji after that, like with a, what was it called? The megaphone one, maybe, um, something like that. Did you know that a click can save your life? Oh, click it. Yep. So yeah, kiddo got a rash. It could be hand, foot and mouth disease know the signs and seek medical care when needed parenting little ones. Yeah. These are great. I actually don't want to show you mine because I think yours are better. So yeah. Awesome job. I think you all are doing wonderful. If anybody else wants to put one in there, go for it. I would love to see what you came up with. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm going to move us on so we can uh, wrap up by three, but again, we will still stay for questions. If anyone has additional questions, we're here for them. So Hopefully today you learned a bit about writing clear, actionable, engaging social media posts to communicate important information to your audiences, about effectively using hashtags and emojis in your posts, about increasing engagement with your content, and a little bit about using alt text to help make sure your posts are accessible. So uh, look at us with two minutes to go before three o'clock. Um, I'm going on here, Emily, tell me if I'm doing something wrong, but it, lo it looks like it's time for the post survey and also 
for questions if anybody wants to put questions in the chat. Yes, thank you so much, Andrea and Nicole. I have learned so much today myself. Um, things that I didn't even know. Um, kind of storytelling within like two to three sentences on social media is so powerful. So thank you so much.